So then this morning, early morning masses, and uh, so we're going to be here in, in Nevada again after such a long being away of the last five days or whatever it was. And uh, so, but in any case, it's good to be back. And that uh, here, the, today is the feast of St. Mary Magdalene the Patsy. We have an anointing also the Vatican will be given at the Mass today. Holy Communion given as a Holy Viaticum. And St. Mary Magdalene the Patsy, uh, the great sister of Holy Nun, named after St. Mary Magdalene, who was a great contemplative, or St. Mary Magdalene, who repented of her sins, and then, uh, you know, spent her life in contemplation of God. And the famous statement of St. Mary Magdalene the Patsy is, Aut pati, aut mori, which she used to say, either let me suffer or let me die. And the great, Mary, great, the great joy of Mary Magdalene was that Mary Magdalene Pazzi is that she is, she is the Mary Magdalene of the suffering of our Lord, that she realized the great joy that is found in suffering. And she found joy in suffering because she recognized how, well, how wonderful are the fruits of suffering. She realized when contemplating, you know, St. Paul, St. Paul says, run as an athlete. The athlete runs and we obtain the prize. When you consider the athlete, when he runs, he exercises, he runs very fast, he lifts weights, and he is experiencing a lot of pain during his exercise. And the athlete, however, runs very happily. He exercises his muscles very much. He gets very exhausted, and he is very happy during the entire thing. And the reason is St. Paul explains the reason why. Because he wants to obtain the prize. His thought is on the prize. And St. Thomas talks about the suffering of the athlete and the suffering of the soldier and the suffering of the saint. And he asks the question, can someone desire suffering? Mary Magdalene of Pazzi is a great famous saint for desiring suffering. Can someone desire to suffer because they want to suffer? And the answer is no. No man, no man can ever desire suffering so that he can suffer. But a man can greatly desire suffering. Like our Lord Jesus Christ did when he came down to the earth and he says, Desiring I have desired. So he says it twice. Desiring I have desired. I have desiring I have desired the great suffering of the cross. And I have run that I might obtain the cross. Can you be baptized by the baptism whereof I am baptized? He turned to his apostles. And it's interesting the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ to his apostles. He said to you, twelve men, that can you be baptized with the baptism whereof I am baptized? And that's a baptism of the cross, the baptism of crucifixion, the baptism of scars. Like Bishop Sheen points out one of the mysteries of the scars, that when our Lord Jesus Christ on the day of the ascension, when he ascended into heaven, his body was perfectly whole, but it was not exactly the same as it was before. And he gave his final blessing that he ever gave to us before he went up into heaven. And he made the blessing with his hands. But the hand had a scar in it. The hand had a scar. And therefore, the Bishop Sheen says, if you want to receive a blessing, a real blessing, it must come from a hand with a scar. That is how distributed blessings are distributed. Does God has willed not just the hand give a blessing, that is the hand of the priest. So that, that, that their hand must have a scar in it. There's something sacred about scars. There's something sacred about wounds. And that when an old soldier says, I was in the war. You see these scars? He's very proud of his scars. These scars I had from battle. I went to war and I received scars. And these scars are my glory. And St. Paul talks about his scars. The scars are the wounds. The scars are the sufferings that we must experience. Some physical, some of the heart. And there must be experience of the scars. And the scars are desired by the saint. The scars are desired by the athlete. Scars are desired by the soldier. Imagine that you go to, to fight a great battle. And you show up at battle, and with no effort, you destroy the enemy. And there's no conflict, there's no difficulty. There's also no great rejoicing in the victory. But if there are scars, and if there is a battle, and if there is suffering then the victory is all the more attained, all the more rejoiced in, when there's a very close battle and a very great battle. And those who know they're going to win, like St. Mary Magdalene the Apostle, she recognized that she was going to receive a great treasure in heaven. And she wanted the greatest possible treasure. 
Therefore, she used to say always to her sisters, she was the head of a convent, either let me suffer, and when I can no longer suffer, then I can go ahead and die. I want to suffer as much as I can, because every suffering is a, is, a, is a star. Every suffering is a mark. Every suffering is a reward. And I want to have the greatest amount of reward. So the Hidavis points out that the soldier does desire suffering. The athlete does desire suffering. The saint does desire suffering. Our Lord Jesus Christ desired to be crucified because of the glory and because of the victory and because of what would happen to the other side. And it's what's supposed to be in our minds when we suffer. Remember our Lord himself said that when you are suffering, when you're doing penance, don't walk around weeping, don't walk around with sorrow on your face, because then you're looking for the attention of men, but rather hide it and rather let there be joy. Now, why should there be joy? Because of the wisdom and recognition that when we suffer for Christ, when we have a little bit of struggling for Christ, then there is a great, great rejoicing. And therefore, the wise man recognizes for each step, for each sorrow, there is a rejoicing. There was once a father of the desert, father of the desert, and he lived in the desert, and he was praying and doing a life of penance, and he used to say his prayers, and then he'd have to walk each day to get his water from the creek. And he would walk about 20 minutes to get his water and walk 20 minutes to back to his water. Realize I don't have much time praying because I'm too far away from the creek. So I'm going to move closer to the creek. So he decided in order to have more time in prayer, he would walk closer to the creek. So he has to go over a little hill and down a little, down a little hill to go to the creek to get his water. So he started walking to the creek. And as he started walking, he heard one, two, three. He stopped. There was nobody there. Turned around. Four, five, six, suck, where are they in? Continue it again. Seven, eight, nine. He said, Who is it? And it was Guardian Angel with a notepad. He said, I'm your guardian angel. So what are you doing? I'm counting your steps. Every step you make to the creek, for every step you make on that long journey from your campsite, which is far from the creek instead of being close to it, I count the steps, and every single step you get a reward in heaven. So he moved his camp. He picked up his camp, and he moved 40 minutes away from the creek. And so the fact is that, that, he, that the angels show to us the importance of that suffering is actually a great blessing. It's a great gift for those that love. And that's why our Lord allows that if there is love in our hearts, love, suffering proves love, and also <clears throat> suffering increases love, and suffering is only born because of love. Our Lord Jesus Christ came out of love from this earth to from heaven to earth. He is on this earth only because of love. And then it was love that made him die upon the cross and made him carry us upon his shoulders into the kingdom of heaven. And he wants that love to be inside of us. And so how can we be the followers of Jesus Christ without desiring to suffer at least a little bit? I'll never let us suffer very much, but a little bit. To suffer a little bit for him. What happened to the apostles in the first record of their suffering? It's in Acts chapter 5. The very first record that we have of the apostles suffering after the crucifixion was that they were thrown into prison. And what does it tell us that they did when they were thrown into prison? And they rejoiced that they might suffer for Christ. That's what the Acts of the Apostles tell us. We got to be thrown in prison. And it's interesting how times have changed. Now we have our mass here. Make sure everybody's six feet away, especially the dogs. <laughs> Make sure everybody's six feet away. Everybody's got to be safe. Make sure you got a, a, a regulations fulfilled. We're worried we might get arrested because it's illegal to have mass now. But when our, when our first ancestors followed Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and they got arrested, they were happy. What has happened? We don't have the right attitude towards the gift of suffering. One day, when, uh, when Matt, Margaret the daughter of St. Thomas More was trying to I mean, it was trying to convince him, don't be a martyr. He was locked up in the prison camp in England, in the Tower of London, with a small little slit of a window looking out towards the gates. And Mar his daughter, was Meg, was saying, look, Tom, you don't, we don't need to be a martyr. You need to, to sign the paper. You're not committing a sin by accepting that the king was married. And while he was discussing, there were four Capuchins who were being hauled off to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And they came in front of the window. And they were being dragged. The way they were dragged, they were martyrdom. The English would take them and tie them upside down with their feet towards the horse and their head aiming down on a couple of pieces of wood. And they would drag them 
across the rocks. And they dragged them from there all the way to the place of the martyrdom. When they arrived at the place of martyrdom, they were then hung, make sure they weren't dead. And then after they were hung, they took, took knives and dug out their guts, cut out their guts, they were drawn. And then they were tied to four horses, so two horses, one horse to each arm, and one horse to each leg, and then they were pulled apart. That's it. And, that, and then and this is what they were going to. And he says, you see, Meg, look at those monks as they were dragged before. They were singing, and they were rejoicing as they were being dragged, of course. He says, you see what they're doing? You're telling me not to be a martyr. You're telling me not to die. Because I am a noble, I will have my head cut off. They are not nobles, therefore they're going to be hung, drawn, and quartered. You're telling me not to go to the treasure of martyrdom? But look at them. They are on their way to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And what are they doing? They are singing. They are rejoicing as if they are going to a wedding. This is their wedding march. Are you going to try to take this away from me, Meg? And she was silent. and She could no longer convince her father not to be a martyr. We must understand that there must be struggles that we must experience sometimes. There must be tribulations. There must be difficulties. But these things are blessings. And then when we receive them, what must be happen if love is in our hearts, if the faith is in our hearts, then we receive these sufferings as a great joy, as a great joy. So in any case, St. Mary Magdalene of Potsy, she was very wise because she knew that suffering was the cause of great joy. And then St. Thomas points out again, we do not desire suffering for the sake of suffering, for this is not right. We don't desire pain because we like pain. We desire pain because of what it gives us, of the, of the reward that we gain because of the pain, the, uh, and of the great, the great happiness that we're going to receive, and the great glory, and the great rest. Because the greater you work, the harder you fight, the longer you stay up at 3 o'clock in the morning, the greater you sleep afterwards. And also St. Thomas Aquinas says, do you want to eat well at the feast? Run hard. For the athlete, the great athlete, eats more. And therefore the wise athlete who likes good food, what does he do? He runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. He fights and fights and fights and fights so he can have a bigger feast. And this is the way it is with the saints. They recognize that there's a bigger feast. That there's a lot of food in heaven. And it tastes pretty doggone good. And then if you want to get more of that food, then a little more suffering, a little more tribulation, a little, one more little trial, one more little gift. And when we take that little trial, the little gift, the more we get, the more food, the more glory, the more joy, the more everything wonderful happens to us in heaven. And hence, those who suffer and on their way to martyrdom, they have great joy because they know what they're going to receive is a most wonderful blessing from a little bit of of suffering. And our Lord will never let us suffer very much. We think it's very much, but it's not very much. It'll be very much like we mentioned very often. He used to hate my little brother very much. And I used to beat him up every single day. And it always made me mad. He would always disobey me, and I would beat him up. He would disobey me, and I'd beat him up every day. And I always get mad because I would hit him. One time I took a big piece of concrete and I smacked him in the back of the head. Because he has no brains, it didn't hurt him at all. <laughs> so I smacked him in the back of the head. I took too close to him. I was about three years old or something. I smashed him in the back of the head. And then, and then, as always he did, every time he did the same thing, he didn't cry at all. He walked upstairs, opened the door, and as soon as he opened the door, ah! then he started crying. <laughs> he said, Mom, go hit me. <laughs> and he would always point out the wrong spot. <laughs> he could never remember where I hit him. So I would get a beating. I'd be really mad. Not only did, did, did he, how was he not? He couldn't even remember where I hit him. <laughs> and so when we go into heaven, did you suffer much in your life? I did. How bad was really bad? Where did it hurt? Uh, well, it was bad. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was one of these arms. <laughs> how bad was it? We're going to think it was very bad, but it wasn't so bad at all. So our, 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 what we think is suffering isn't really suffering. And Lord would never let us suffer as he suffered. He'll never let our hearts be broken like the apostles' hearts are broken. He'll never let us suffer as he suffered. Never let our hearts be wounded like our mother's heart was wounded. But let us experience a small wound. 
Let's experience a little bit of suffering. And when we offer a little suffering, the little suffering that he does allow us to have from time to time, and when we offer that up to him because we want to have a great reward, he will give us a very great reward for a little bit of suffering. But we should receive this suffering and thank God. And that's why it's a very important rule of the supernatural life. If you stub your toe, if you drop an anvil on your toe, if you step on a nail, what do you do? Thank you, Lord, for this gift. Thank you, Lord, for this gift. And a parishioner wants a hot temper. said, always say, thank you, Lord, for this gift. Hey, Father, this week I had lots of gratitude. It was a week of gratitude, Father. Gratitude, and I'm sick of gratitude. <laughs> but the fact is that there must be, thank you, Lord, for this gift. When you have a little suffering, thank you, Lord, for this gift. Thank you, Lord, for this gift. Everything is a gift. But those are the household of the faith. And so I thank God for the gift of suffering that St. Mary Magdalene Potsy understood so very well. And our Lord will never let us suffer greatly, but a little bit will give us a great reward in the kingdom of heaven. And may I ask the grace to carry a few scars, a few scars with us that will be our glory forever. Let us give us you all in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit.